So first to start off with our session five, I am pleased to introduce our moderator for this session, Chen Cohen, and I'll provide you a bit of background for Cohen. So Chen Cohen is a partner at Dialogue and brings an impressive wealth of knowledge in large, complex institutional projects. As an integrated designer with a background in both interior design and architecture, she delivers a hol holistic approach to designing buildings from the inside out. Recognized by numerous national and international design awards, her work is characterized by exceptional quality of light, careful material choices, strategic use of color, and timeless design details that translate the architectural language to a human scale. Cohn's impressive portfolio encompasses a diverse range of large complex institutional buildings, including academic, civic, sports, and recreation, and healthcare projects. She is known for her meticulous and collaborative approach involving stakeholders from the early concept phase to project completion. Her passion for universal and equitable design is evident in all her projects as she explores cultural, physical, and gender sensitivities to support and enhance the user experience and has recently achieved the Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility Certification known as RHFAC, a professional designation to promote conversations and design solutions that improve meaningful use and equitable experiences of her projects. Many of these things which are also overlapping with the symposium. So really wonderful to have your expertise, Cohn. Thank you for joining us. And so with this, I will hand the screen over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lois, and good, every, good afternoon, everyone. The pandemic changed the way we live and work, and this session looks at interior design from the perspective of indoor environmental quality, IEQ, to understand user-centered design and healthy spaces that support well-being and productivity in workspaces. A subset of IEQ, indoor air quality, IAQ, although invisible to the eye, has potentially dramatic impacts, both good and bad, about air in the spaces we occupy. Two speakers contributing to this session today are Dr. Orchen Bergeric Gerber, Dean's Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Southern California, and Dr. Jeffrey Siegel, Bain Tannenbaum Chair in Civil Engineering in the Department of Civil and Mineral Engineering at the University of Toronto. Presenting first is Dr. Borgen Bergeric Gerber, Chair and Dean's Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Southern California. She also serves as the co-director of the Center for in Intelligent Environments, Sentience, at USC. Her research focuses on interactions between the built environment and its users, and aims to understand and predict how and why humans interact with their built environment. She then uses this information to develop novel technologies, interfaces, tools to improve human experience, well-being, and performance, as well as to achieve societal objectives such as energy efficiency, safety, security, and health. In her work, Fortune uses machine learning and data science to improve design, construction, and system intelligence of user-centered built environments. Her work has received support worth over 12 million individual and collaborative grants from a variety of agencies, including the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, Department of Transportation, Department of Homeland Security, California Energy Commission, and various corporate sponsors. She has authored and co-authored over 200 peer-reviewed publications, one book, and two book chapters. Thank you for being here, Borchen. I will hand the screen over to you. Thank you, Cohen, for that wonderful introduction. I am going to start with sharing uh, my screen. Hopefully everybody can see my screen. Great. Um, Cohen, thank you again for the, the introduction. Luis, uh, thank you for um, inviting me to this important event. Uh, my name is Burchin Bejerek Gerber. Um, I am a professor in the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department of University of Southern California. I'm also the department chair for the last two and a half years. Um, I have of uh, a mixed background. Uh, I have been uh, traditionally uh, educated as an architect, uh, focusing mostly on the architectural engineering side of uh, design. 
Um, then uh, a few uh, life-changing events uh, made me pursue uh, construction engineering and management at Berkeley. Um, and I was very much intrigued with technology uh, in uh, the region. So I wanted to continue my studies, focusing on the intersection of engineering architecture and uh, enabled by technology. Um, so I worked uh, briefly uh, as a technology consultant uh, in an environmental engineering firm. Then I joined USC in 2008. And since then I've been working um, in an area called, uh, we call human building interaction. I'm going to explain that very briefly. Um, so here you see a couple links if you're interested in learning more about uh, my research and our, our center, Center for Intelligent Environments, uh, the links are provided. So in my lab, we focus on human-centered built environments. Um, I try to bring my background in design, architecture, and engineering together to focus on um, buildings that are designed, constructed, and operated around occupants' needs. Um, this is a very rich area if you think about different building types, uh, as well as different uh, objectives that uh, these buildings uh, support. Um, so I try to understand building occupants' needs, requirements, uh, habits, uh, uh, and and bring those into the building design and operation um, as best as uh, we can. Um, so this is a new or maybe emerging field, uh, human building interaction. This is a graph that we have generated with uh, more than 25 authors uh, that shows different pillars uh, of, of human building interaction. And I, I think the one on the left, uh, left top uh, is important human performance and well-being, right? Uh, that's uh, what the buildings should or the built environment should support in our opinion. Of course, building design and operation are very important, supported by the technological sensing and awareness. Uh, there are different connectors here. And in the middle, you have equity, privacy, sustainability, but there could be also other uh, objectives, of course, uh, individual and societal. So health intertwines with our built environment, um, shaping our well-being. Just looking at these two pictures, probably you have different uh, feelings, emotions um, uh, triggered um, inside you. Um, and this has been an this has been an important area of investigation for me. Um, I started actually looking into thermal comfort earlier in my research. What we realized uh, is current building design uh, does not support uh, our individual differences. Just take thermal comfort as an example. Uh, when you have, we have done a simulation research where we discovered that when you have more than three occupants in one uh, mechanical zone, you are not able to uh, provide to those people because we have so much differences in ourselves that we cancel out uh, uh, um, our, our uh, so it's it's not uh, proper for it's not possible for the mechanical systems to provide to all of us. So this is a collaboration with uh, a global engineering company, Aro, where we have um, developed this intelligent desk uh, with sensors embedded in them. Uh, that this desk knows you, uh, what your preferences are, and uh, and uh, and provides uh, lighting and thermal conditions um, per your preferences, and that also uh, reduces the centralized uh, HVAC system requirements. Uh, one part of this research was ergonomics. I'm sure uh, if you are an office worker, you're going to relate to this, that we spend so much of our time sitting. And this is a collaboration with uh, colleagues from occupational science, where we're trying to understand uh, what happens to our body when we're sitting behind a computer uh, extensive periods of time. And then other parts of this research uh, relate to how do we communicate with document, uh, 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 occupant, um, the office worker and what are some 
the best postures and how do we get uh, uh, occupants from baseline to the healthier uh, postures. As this research was happening, um, pandemic started. <laughs> And I know you're focused on, on some of the lessons learned uh, from the pandemic. Um, so we thought it might be maybe a couple months and we will be back. Uh, but at the same time, seeing the uh, stay at home orders uh, across uh, the country and the globe, we thought this could be a unique opportunity to survey uh, different office workers uh, since our, our work was focused on office workers, to understand how they adapted their home offices. So we did this uh, survey very early in the in the pandemic, as you can see, uh, for 45 days, uh, late April to early June. And we received over uh, almost a thousand uh, uh, valid responses. And I will show some of our findings from this uh, this this survey. In general, uh, people were satisfied with uh, their indoor environmental quality factors, um, but uh, they were most satisfied with their indoor air quality, which was very, very interesting for us. But we realized that income significantly predicts having a better having better indoor air quality and temperature, and uh, and income also tends to also predict uh, better natural lighting and noise. I believe these are uh, not surprising to us. Uh, workers were least satisfied with noise uh, during the remote work hours. Of course, that was a very special uh, period of pandemic, right? We were with our children, with our elderly, with our pets. Um, so that's understandable. Um, but what happened was almost 70% of the respondents reported a new physical health issue and almost 74% of the respondents re reported a new mental health issue, which is uh, which alarmed us because this uh, these numbers are quite high and this is new compared to before uh, pandemic. So we looked at... Uh, uh, physical symptoms and uh, indoor air quality. And uh, as you can see here, low satisfaction with humidity was a major predictor for physical health symptoms. Um, and no surprise, low satisfaction with noise was a predictor for uh, fatigue and headache. Um, also not surprising, low satisfaction with glare predicted musculoskeletal disorders and low satisfaction with natural light predicted eye symptoms. Um, this is uh, the same uh, um, uh, analysis, but for mental health symptoms, as you can see, again, noise comes up here. Uh, is a low, low satisfaction with noise is a major predictor for mental health symptoms, and in general, workers with higher income had better overall health, mental health. So, one of the one of the findings that jumped out for us was stress uh, in the survey. 50% of the study population indicated they had increased stress. And that is also understandable, right? The uncertainty that comes with the pandemic and, uh, and uh, having to adapt uh, overnight, at least in California, from normal working conditions to remote working conditions. But we got really interested in this. Uh, and we said, taking some of our research in thermal comfort, looking at indoor air quality um, and, uh, and other factors, can we also predict stress and what contributes to stress in the built environment? So we, and, and sorry, I should have mentioned, uh, starting now, I'm going to have some questions uh, for the group here. Uh, I don't have the answers to all of these questions, but I thought having these provoking questions here and there might also um, trigger some uh, thinking on the on the audience side, and we can discuss some of these questions as well. But one of the questions we asked was, with the rapid advancements in sensor technologies, what uh, a truly healthy buildings could look like in the near future? So stress, coming back to stress, uh, we looked at literature 
Um, and we've seen there's a lot of stress research using physiological sensors and other, other data uh, from the environment or the occupants. But mostly they looked at uh, de-stress, which is the negative stress. But there is also eustress, which is positive stress. And this is the stress that you feel, but uh, you're still enabled and you're very productive. Maybe you're working towards a deadline. I'm sure you felt that there is stress, but it's not, it's not a stress that is uh, negatively affecting you. So we wanted to understand how we can actually differentiate eustress from de-stress because you want to have eustress in the environment and reduce the de-stress, right? You don't want to take stress out. So there are so many uh, physiological signals of stress, as you can see on this slide. And there are also several behavioral uh, signals of stress from speech to facial expressions to posture and, 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 and more. Um, so there are also many sensors these days uh, that uh, you can capture these physiological and behavioral signals with, with varying costs, uh, as you can see also on the slide. So we did a lab study. We started with a lab study where we brought 50 participants, office workers, in a low stress and a high stress environment. I'm not going to get into the details uh, probably we don't have time for those, but um, during these uh, experiments, we have collected uh, their physiological sensors, uh, sen um, uh, information, but also action units on their faces, uh, their gaze, and 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 their human uh, uh, computer interaction and indicators as well. So here is a uh, one um, one. Uh, chart that I'm showing you because what we were interested in is what is the what is the least amount of data we can use because collecting data and processing data and analyzing data has a cost and how we can get uh, what, what is the combination of the data we can get the most accuracy uh, and here you see different combinations if you use everything you're reaching almost uh, 82 percent or 83 percent but one thing that we have realized through numerous analysis is electrodermal activity and skin temperature were uh, the best uh, features to be used in machine learning algorithms to, to be able to differentiate use stress from these stress. Okay, so one question, uh, and this doesn't have to be related to stress, but how to balance cost, privacy, and security with accurate health detection, right? Uh, with all these sensing uh, mechanisms available to us. At the same time, uh, while there is so much research on health in buildings, um, there are not many implementations in real buildings. And uh, and if you look at what, it, what the objectives are from a building manager or from an employer perspective, there's staff retention, revenue per employee, lowering absenteeism and presenteeism, or if you're in a environment, uh, learning environment, maybe academic achievement or higher student test scores, uh, if you're in a hospital, reduce length of stay, right? So that made us think like, how can we prove that healthier environments also lead into productivity? Because uh, I know from my previous research, to come as building owners, you always have to also prove to them that there are uh, productivity benefits specifically in the office environments. So we started looking at how buildings affect stress, creativity, attention, and productivity. And I'm going to show you one um, set of results from that same study. But th these are some of the facts that uh, 83% of American uh, or um, workers in in the United States suffer from work-related stress. Of course, there are productivity loss implications as well as financial cost implications and such. So here is a busy graph. Maybe I, um, I, I have a better interpretation of all of that. Uh, and it is, it is, it is this one. This is Yorkins Dawson Law, and I'm happy to share the papers that outline this. But what we were able to prove that this part at the lower part uh, where um, 
I don't know if you can see my uh, cursor, is where there is no use stress or de-stress. This is the part that you're bored, right? As you climb up this uh, curve, this is the use stress part uh, that you are engaged in your work. Uh, you're very productive, um, but you're not negatively impacted. Here comes the de-stress and use stress together where your productivity lowers. And at the very end of this curve, this is the de-stress where you're not able to anymore uh, produce. And this is this is the Jurgen Dawson law is a well-known curve, but what we were able to do in our research is quantitatively map the data that we collected from uh, participants in terms of their productivity and stress into this uh, map. So considering the multifaceted nature of health, how can we systematically measure and address the impact on productivity within varying work environments, right? I showed you one lab experiment, but health in buildings has, you know, it's multifaceted from colors to patterns to, to biomes to, I mean, you name it, right? Uh, there's so many different considerations uh, to make. Um, if you take it to the built environment, of course, uh, there's uh, also more to add into, into those considerations. So it is, it is a difficult question how to, to answer, uh, but isolating and quantifying the specific components of built environments that contribute to increase or decrease health levels, I think is a very important one and and as you can see uh, from my presentation i'm very interested in quantification um, and we did some studies actually in the lab uh, to look into how built environment can facilitate uh, better uh, health outcomes and and these were related to stress uh, we looked at for example the bergamon scent uh, and we we you showed mathematically that, or, or, or through data, I'm sorry, uh, that uh, it reduces the uh, heart rate variable to signals after a stressor, which is an indicator of stress. But what we realize is that there are gender differences. Male participants uh, reported differently, self-reported different than the female participants, even though their physiological sensing uh, was very similar. Uh, we looked at white noise um, and we found that exposure to 45 decibel white noise reduces electrodermal uh, activity compared to ambient noise, uh, similar ambient noise while at work. Uh, we also looked at color temperature. We're working on anal analyzing uh, those results. But everything I've shown you so far are related to or 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 outcomes or findings from short-term experiments that are done in the lab, right? And those are great because uh, you can standardize, you can control uh, the environment uh, or the variables you want to measure. Uh, but the disadvantages are it's artificial setting, right? Even though you can control uh, in, in a naturalistic environment, these variables exist, coexist. Uh, Long-term studies are important, um, but they're very difficult. They're time consuming. There is high dropout rates. Data becomes huge and, and you have to have uh, good ways of handling large uh, data. And here is one uh, one example. So the study that I have shown you uh, was a 70 minute uh, study, the stress one. And uh, we artificially induced stress and we had 2.5 gigabytes per participant in terms of data. This is another study we're undertaking right now. We're collecting data from 30 office workers for about six months. Uh, both from their home offices and their formal offices. And we're going to have about 80 gigabytes per participant. And it is realistic stress conditions. Uh, so that's one good thing about lab experiments that you know that you're stressing them because you do pilot studies. So you know the data will be useful from that perspective. In realistic environment, we don't know what the conditions are going to be. And we have to, we have to work with... Uh, uh, with the realist that data. Uh, so one question that I always ask to my students and my colleagues is to what extent 
control lab findings be generalized, right? And is there any lines we can draw between experimental control and real world applicability? So we looked at the literature um, and uh, we found uh, 75 longitudinal studies linking indoor air quality to built environment relating to different outcomes, right? This could be energy, comfort, health. Um, we found only 14 of them uh, examined health, IEQ's impact on health. And only six of them ask for ecological momentary assessments. These are assessments that you ask uh, how they feel from, uh, from the participants. And those six only had one daily EMAs. And only two studies implemented multiple daily EMAs. So you, you see here uh, how uh, the research narrows down. Um, so in our study, we are... Uh, we're, 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 we have uh, four EMAs a day over six months. So we'll see what, what we can see. But what we are interested in our study is quantification of the duration and frequency of exposure of some IEQ factors on health. And we also want to understand the link between productivity and health. And I am very interested combining my previous research and on energy efficiency and human health I am asking like, are these competing or, or complementary objectives, right? You can, can you reduce energy and also improve health? And I am interested in the control part as well. So once we know the answers to these questions, how do we operate buildings at the nexus of comfort, health, and energy? So I mentioned uh, uh, this new study that we're collecting uh, through EMAs, uh, sick building syndrome, uh, symptoms, comfort levels, productivity, mood, and stress. In the middle, you see the physiological uh, data we're collecting. And on the right, you see the indoor environmental quality factors we're collecting. Um, so we would like to understand, uh, and, and, and I, I shouldn't maybe even put this there, but we are looking at only one participant and trying to understand how, how their mood and productivity uh, impact uh, are impacted by indoor air quality, but uh, there's nothing to conclude here. So as we dive deeper into the relationship between the built environment and stress or health, uh, right, uh, other aspects of health and well-being, what we will uncover is a very interesting uh, path, I think, uh, to take uh, for researchers who are interested in this area. But at the same time, uh, these are some of the considerations I'm almost done uh, with my presentation. Um, health benefits of improved working conditions should be quantified and fed into the operational costs. I think that's one way to uh, realize uh, some of our uh, uh, findings, uh, research or lab-based findings into the real world. Uh, but there is also a collective consideration of built environment features uh, is important, right? And this group here with uh, uh, designers, interior designers and other designers are important because there's color, contrast, materials, natural shapes, patterns, choices, all that kind of um, good stuff uh, and this, their effect on well-being. But then there is also lack of consideration of individual preferences, right? Personalized approaches are really important, uh, and and how to how to realize that in the real world, uh, in the, the real world world building uh, design is uh, very important. So I, I lastly I want to mention a network of network that um, I am part of, and it is well being in the built environment network. And we have been operational, actually, we got this grant in October 2019, right before the pandemic. Uh, uh, but then we had to turn every activity into virtual uh, in the first two years. But the aim uh, of this uh, network is bringing different networks focusing on health in buildings uh, together uh, from health sciences to engineering to design to social sciences to start uh, exploring together um, and, and working together. We are going to submit another grant in December for phase two of this network. Uh, and if anybody is interested, 
please email me and, and we can discuss uh, how we can include the interested parties. So with that, I'm going to stop my presentation. I don't know how well I did with the, with the timing, but uh, I perfect. will have um, opportunities for Q&A at the end. Thank you so much, Borchen. Uh, you're perfect on time and uh, right uh, for us to segue into our next speaker. Um, I'd like to introduce and invite Dr. Jeffrey Siegel to join for the second presentation. Uh, Dr. Siegel is a professor of civil and mineral engineering at the University of Toronto and is a Bain Tannenbaum Chair in Civil Engineering. He holds joint appointments at the Dalalana School of Public Health in the Department of Physical and Environmental Sciences. He has an MS and a PhD in Mechanical Engineering from the University of California, Berkeley, as well as a Bachelor of Science from Swarthmore College. He is internationally recognized for his work in indoor air quality generally and air cleaning specifically, and is a fellow of ASHRAE and a member of the Academy of Fellows of the International Society of Indoor Air and Climate. His research interests include healthy and sustainable living, buildings, filtration and air cleaning, ventilation and indoor air quality in residential and commercial buildings, control of indoor particulate matter, and the impact of building systems on indoor microbiology and chemistry. He has published over 100 peer-reviewed journal articles on indoor air quality and related subjects and has been active in disseminating information about filtration and ventilation solutions for COVID-19. Thank you for joining today. I'll hand over the screen over to you, Jeff. You're Great. muted. Thank you, Vert. Perfect. You're good. I'm good, okay. Uh, thank you uh, very much for the introduction and for the invitation to be here. Um, what I wanna do a little bit today is think about um, how we should be thinking about indoor air, particularly in an interior design context, and of course, thinking about what role COVID plays. And uh, I'll start uh, by saying uh, someone yesterday, I think it was David, said that uh, he apologized for using slides. I've got two apologies to make. Not only do I reuse slides, I also reuse jokes. And so uh, uh, apologies for that in advance. So, you know, we've heard a little bit of history uh, over the course of some of the other presentations and uh, indoor air quality is not a new thing. Uh, if you go back to some of the earliest uh, writings we have on buildings, uh, this is a passage from the Bible. And to spare you from reading it, uh, basically all you need to know is that the field of mold remediation has not advanced dramatically in the past few thousand years. But this passage is about what you do if you have mold in your building. Uh, uh, if we jump ahead a few thousand years uh, in the 1800s, uh, there was this uh, uh, German hygienist and, and chemist, uh, Dr. Pettenkofer, uh, and uh, he has uh, lots and lots of pithy quotes, like the one on the screen where uh, he highlights the importance of getting rid of the source of indoor pollution before you turn to something like ventilation. Around the same time, uh, especially in the US, uh, there was a lot of popular writing about indoor air quality. Uh, this this uh, this quote and uh, some of the chapter excerpts that are on the screen now uh, by, are by uh, Catherine and Harriet Beecher Stowe, uh, and uh, uh, they were um, uh, 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 Harriet Beecher Stowe is known as an abolitionist, but uh, they wrote uh, about the um, the importance of the kind of domestic realm, and um, they write a lot about indoor air quality and ventilation. Uh, as the text on the screen indicates. And by the way, this was a best-selling book. So people have been thinking about these issues for a very long time. And specifically, they were writing a lot about prevention of spread of infectious disease. The other thing that's come up a few times, but I think is really important to highlight is that indoor air quality is also a story of disparities. Uh, so what you see in the uh, picture, the photograph, is uh, uh, air samples that were taken over one week on filters. Uh, and you can kind of tell uh, both what's in the air uh, and how much is in the air by the color and the, 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 the darkness of the filter. So these are nine different filters from different apartments in the same uh, building, same apartment building in, in, in Toronto. 
and the green one with green tape is is a blank. So what a clean filter looks like. And uh, what you can see is that, you know, there is, you can just, you don't need to be an expert to see that there's more stuff in the air in some of these homes than in, 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 in others. Uh, the brown color is associated with environmental tobacco smoke. Uh, and the gray is just kind of the general background of, of, of indoor particles. Uh, and if you look at filter 28, uh, which is in the top row there, uh, that's an, an apartment where um, uh, there wasn't any smoking going on, but you can still see a little bit of a brown color there. And some of the speakers uh, yesterday talked about how pollution moves from, from different uh, uh, connected spaces to each other. And that's kind of a physical example of it. Well, this has really important kind of practical in implications. Uh, the two graphs show the uh, concentration of flame retardants on the top and uh, phthalates, a uh, type of plasticizer on the bottom, where we're con comparing social housing, multi-unit residential building apartments or MERBs uh, with a, a population of, uh, of, of homes in Toronto, single family homes. And you can see for almost all of these compounds, you see one to two orders of magnitude. Uh, so, you know, something like 10 to 100 times more uh, of the contaminant in the apartments uh, than in the homes. And we see this over and over again with COVID, with a variety of, of indoor air pollutants that, that different people are differently exposed and differently at risk. And that's an important um, piece to have in mind. So I also like to talk about myths in indoor air quality. Uh, and I picked three myths that I wanna talk about today because um, I think that they'll have some, hopefully they'll generate some discussion and they respond, uh, at least some of them, to some of the things that have been said already. So one of the things we might think about when uh, 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 designing a building are the architectural coatings. And in this case, I wanna talk about paint. And uh, uh, most of us have an experience with paint and you know a classic thing we might do because uh, we want to do the right thing from an indoor air quality perspective is to use a low uh, VOC paint. VOC is is a volatile organic compound. Uh, Shelley mentioned them yesterday. And so low VOC paints they smell less. Uh, they do in fact emit less VOCs and they dry faster. So that seems great. However, if you look in the literature. Um, what they're doing is they're emitting less overall VOCs, but they actually have higher emission rates than some VOCs that are important for our health. They also emit another class of compound called semi-volatile organic compounds, many of which we might have health concerns about. Uh, and in general, uh, you see a lot of kind of poor ventilation recommendations, you know, saying you can occupy sooner because it doesn't smell, when in fact um, they can be uh, quite harmful. So of course, people go further and, and they say, well, why don't we use no VOC paints? And there's a variety of no VOC paints on the market. Um, most of them use linseed oil or something similar as the base. And linseed oil is um, very chemically reactive. So if you have ozone, uh, which was talked about a little bit yesterday or other oxidants in the space, you get chemical reactions and the paint um, uh, emits a whole bunch of things, including particles that, that might be important to health. And so um, the, the, this is a good example where we think the right thing to do is to use one of these green building materials, but they can actually cause significant indoor air quality concern. And so what's the right thing to do? Um, uh, I prefer to paint with ordinary latex paint and wait as long as you can before occupancy as well as, you know, to the extent possible, think about surfaces that don't need to be painted. Another example uh, is, is the idea of integrating plants. And uh, uh, there is a lot of information uh, out there uh, suggesting that plants improve uh, indoor air quality, uh, lots of messaging, uh, including from uh, some, some reputable sources uh, uh, saying that, that plants are a good thing for indoor air. Most of this stems from an article uh, that's 30 years old or so at this point. It was done by a couple of uh, researchers uh, from NASA who uh, they looked at a bunch of plants and a bunch of VOCs, and they saw that uh, when they did experiments in a sealed chamber, 
that they would see a diminishment of many of these VOCs. Now, the challenge with this research is that it was done in sealed chambers. Uh, buildings are anything but sealed, and there's a lot of other things going on. And if you look in the literature, and the graph I just put on the screen is a, a, a review paper where the researchers looked at a whole bunch of different studies on plants, and they looked at how much they actually clean the air. And their findings were that plants did not clean the air at all. That, that value on the, uh, on the, the x-axis there is something called the clean air delivery rate. It's a measure of cleaning power. And uh, these are just tiny, tiny numbers. Plants uh, simply don't make a difference uh, at all to indoor air. And so this is an, an, an interesting myth that's, that's very prevalent. And it's kind of a little bit worse than that. Um, if you look in the literature, there are many case studies, a couple of which I put on the screen, uh, where uh, it shows that plants can, can contribute. The top one talks about uh, uh, fungi and some fungal byproducts that can be um, uh, quite serious, particularly for immunocompromised individuals. The bottom one talks, talks about uh, uh, microorganisms that can be emitted from hydroponics. So even if you take out the soil. Uh, and you know, I don't want to overstate this. I don't think you're going to die if you're in a building with a plant, uh, obviously. But I do want to point out that sometimes we do things in indoor air that can present risks. Uh, for some of the uh, inhabitants in the space. And then the last example I wanna talk about here are essential oil diffusers, especially because they just came up. So uh, I never really thought much about essential oil diffusers until we were doing a completely unrelated study on filtration. Uh, and we were in a bunch of different homes in Toronto. And there was this one condo in downtown Toronto where we measured the particle concentrations in this study over the course of the year. And every single night at about midnight, you would see this massive increase in particle concentrations uh, in the in the in the space. It would go on till you know three or four in the morning, and then would 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 um, would diminish. And uh, you know, I had a lot of theories for what this was, but to make a long story short, uh, the person who lived in this apartment ran an essential oil diffuser on a timer every night. And an essential oil diffuser, if you're not familiar with them, it's essentially an ultrasonic humidifier that you put some water in, you put, uh, uh, you put your favorite essential oil in it, and uh, it, it puts a pleasing scent throughout the room. Well, this got us very interested, and we did some research uh, on different essential oils. So the top plot here shows the emission of very small particles from the use of an essential oil diffuser. And you can see it depends uh, on the oil type. Uh, but you're seeing quite high emission rates, uh, you know, certainly not as high as something like a cigarette, but not that far off as well. And so uh, very high emissions. And that top plot was done with very, very clean distilled water, uh, laboratory grade distilled water that we use for instruments. So when we did it with tap water, um, we saw that, for example, for the eucalyptus oil, you saw this five uh, fold or so increase in emissions because the emissions aren't just coming from the oil, they're coming from the minerals and other impurities in the water. And so, you know, this is another example of something that, you know, degrades indoor air quality. And um, a follow-up study we did, which is the second citation at the bottom of the screen, we took human subjects and exposed them to essential oil diffuser emissions and then had them perform a cognitive battery. And what we found when we compared a placebo case to the case where they were exposed to essential oil diffuser emissions, the one finding that was very, very resonant is that people made more impulsive decisions. And so this you know, probably partially explains why when you go into a store and they're putting a scent in the air, um, part of the rationale behind that is to make people spend more money. So another good example of a myth. So I want to kind of transition from that uh, to, to, you know, kind of the very big picture here is we have this serious problem with indoor air. We know how to solve it. Others have talked about uh, this over the course uh, of the symposium. We want to get rid of sources to the extent we can. Uh, once we've done that as much as we can, we want to ventilate. Uh, once we've done that, or sometimes that isn't always possible, uh, we want to clean the air. And uh, we also want to keep the environment dry. So 
in this context, this broader context, we also now have COVID, of course, and we have many other uh, infectious diseases. And so we have this new challenge, but also I would argue a new opportunity. And so many others have talked about this, uh, this, this Swiss cheese model. And so I'm not gonna go through it other than to say, most of my research focuses on the idea of the holes in the ventilation and filtration layer. And so uh, what I wanna do for a lot of the rest of today is kind of talk about those holes and how they manifest in real buildings and what, what we might do from an interior design perspective to address them. So the first comment I wanna make is that we really have to think about what kind of spaces. So if you have a high risk space, you need more of those layers of protection. And uh, you know there are some of the risk factors that many have already talked about in the symposium so far. Uh, there's also particular occupational activities, uh, came up a little bit this morning, uh, donning and doffing PPE uh, uh, can be important. Some particular environments like uh, environments that are cold and poorly ventilated, like refrigerated food processing facilities have a very high risk, uh, any type of communal living. You also, of course, have to think about the susceptibility uh, of the occupants. And so the very big picture here is, you know, first of all, from a design perspective, you have to think about the space that you're, um, that you're addressing and how many layers uh, uh, you need to have for protection. So I mentioned I most of my research focuses on ventilation and filtration. Um, when we say ventilation, we mean fresh air coming from outside. Uh, when we say filtration, we mean air that is recirculated in the space, but is cleaned of, of respiratory particles uh, or other particles. Uh, and you know, before I talk about a lot of things, I wanna just highlight that nothing I'm gonna talk about today is a silver bullet. Um, there's no, these things don't magically replace the need for other measures we might do. Uh, but, uh, and I think uh, uh, Dr. Prather mentioned this, you know, they offer a lot of benefits beyond just COVID-19 transmission risk reduction. And I think further, they've been kind of underutilized. So we know a lot about how to do ventilation and filtration well, and that's not what I'm going to talk about today, but, but here's a very quick synopsis. Uh, uh, is that basically we have to um, pay attention to these things when we do them and, uh, and, and do them well. And so what, I think that there's potentially a little bit of a disconnect here because a lot of the things on this list don't necessarily interface, at least in traditional ways, with interior design. And so I would argue that interior designers are really important to issues of indoor air quality for a few different reasons. The first one is that they're at the table uh, when a lot of these decisions and a lot of this, this, this material gets discussed. And so I think it's really important that um, very often those with public health expertise, those with specific engineering expertise are not at the table. Uh, when these things are discussed. And so um, that's one reason why it's important. The other reason, and, and I'll go into detail on this, is that interior designers have a lot of impact on the context. And the context really affects uh, how, 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 how well ventilation and filtration and other measures uh, will, will address indoor air quality generally and infectious disease transmission as well. And so in order to address indoor air quality, we need a few things. We need good information. We need uh, uh, the ability to understand the impact of decisions we make about, uh, the, uh, about the interior. And we need to proactively address some of the uh, infectious disease issues that have been discussed uh, uh, here today. And overall, that's how we get to promoting a healthy indoor environment. So let's start with the good information. Good information on indoor air quality is, is actually much harder than it seems. Uh, very few jurisdictions, if any, is indoor air quality regulated or regulated well. Uh, there's just this whole list of compounds of interest. You know, we've been talking a lot about COVID-19 at this symposium, but you know, there's, there's a million other things. There's other, other diseases, both respiratory and otherwise. 
And there's also a lot of misinformation and the misinformation takes different forms. We sometimes have misinformation that comes from uh, uh, you know, nominally trustworthy authorities. Uh, we have misinformation that comes from manufacturers of products that purport to uh, improve the indoor environment. And so, uh, uh, oh, there's a quote here from Dr. Pettenkofer again, uh, 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 that, that there is a lot of potential for misinformation here. And so I encourage people to think about uh, a variety of high quality independent sources. And I've listed a few here that all have good information on, on indoor air quality. Uh, and you know this is not all uh, North American, of course. Uh, uh, it, one example here is Hong Kong. The Hong Kong government has a series of these very good uh, pamphlets. Some of them run to, to 20 or 30 or 40 pages to talk about how to address uh, different indoor air quality issues and in different environments. And so there is a lot of good information out there. And there's a lot of efforts like this. Um, and this is one I'm gonna talk about because I was involved with it, but, but there's many, many others uh, uh, throughout the world. And uh, we recognize that a lot of community congregate settings were not being provided with good information about how to protect their their users and their employees from the pandemic, as well as general indoor air quality issues. So that led to a checklist uh, uh, that was kind of a, a plain language guidance for uh, community organizations on how to, how to reduce transmission of COVID-19. We ran for, and we're still running, but we ran for over two years, office hours uh, as much as once a week. Uh, for community organizations where organizations could sign up and come in and talk about their specific facilities. We've tried to respond to, to issues that become important. Uh, we had a lot of wildfire smoke in Ontario uh, this summer, and so we provided guidance on, on wildfire smoke. And again, you'll find many, many efforts like this uh, uh, throughout the world. So I want to move from information to context. So um, uh, the context is so important. So what's on this graph here is uh, the probability that a particular air cleaner will have a given effectiveness. So what we did here is we took uh, over two two-week periods, and this is uh, Rafsan Nayan, who's a, 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 a student uh, working with me. Uh, he took uh, these, uh, this air cleaner, uh, and for two weeks he ran it on low speed, and for two weeks he ran it on high speed. And what you see on the x-axis here is something called effectiveness. Effectiveness is how well the air cleaner is working in this particular space. It happened to be an office space. And uh, if the effectiveness is 100%, it's perfectly cleaning the air. If the effectiveness is 0%, it's not making a difference. And if the effectiveness is less than zero, it's uh, a higher concentration when the air cleaner is operating than when it's not operating. And the main thing I want you to get from this plot is just how wide the distribution is. So over the two weeks, for example, when the air cleaner is operating on high speed uh, that's in blue, you can get an effectiveness near perfection. You can get an effectiveness that's negative and you can be you know, somewhere in between. You are most of the time. And so there is this, uh, uh, there is this inherent fact about many of the measures we take in indoor environments. This is the very same environment under somewhat controlled circumstances. We didn't let the, the users of the office disable the air cleaner. And uh, uh, you can see that it, 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 it really has a wide range of performance. And that's why the context is important. And, you know, Fundamentally, there's lots of factors that contribute to the variation. Some of them are kind of outside of the, of the control uh, of, uh, of the designer. Uh, for example, you know, how big is the room? Uh, uh, what's the background ventilation rate? What's going on outside? Uh, uh, the clean air delivery rate of the air cleaner itself. But then there's a whole bunch of kind of factors that start to get in control of the designers and the occupants of the building. Uh, are windows open? Are, uh, uh, where is the air cleaner placed? Um, what things might be done to promote or inhibit mixing in the space? As well as a whole bunch of behavioral factors. One of the things you often hear about portable air cleaners is people turn them off because they're noisy. 
Uh, and so uh, uh, there is a lot of opportunity for kind of providing information here uh, uh, to users about how to use air cleaners well. And it's just one practical example of that. This is research from 15 years ago or so uh, where uh, Attila Novoselatz uh, led this. And uh, we had a test house and we had a particle source located in one part of the house and we put uh, uh, different air cleaners in different locations uh, in the house. And the low air cleaner, the 50 meter cube per hour, uh, clean air delivery rate air cleaner, it really didn't matter where you put it. It wasn't very effective uh, anywhere, but similarly not very effective everywhere. But the good air cleaner, the one with a much higher clean air delivery rate, it really mattered where it was in this house how effective it was overall at removing pollutants. And that had to do with the airflows in the house and how the pollutants from that source traveled to the air cleaner. And so there's really uh, this important issue that we have to tell people how to use air cleaners and we have to promote design that lets people use air cleaners well. Um, so some of the very practical things uh, interior designers can do is one, you know, first of all, use air cleaners. They can be very effective, as several several others have talked about. Um, have to be kind of good consumers of, of air cleaners. Know the 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 things that differentiate them, uh, their performance, uh, uh, and you know, provide contextual information to users so that uh, so that they're used well. I'm getting towards the end here, but I want to touch on uh, just a few other things that um, that are important. So this is some research from an apartment in Austin, Texas, in uh, the summer of 2020. And uh, what you see here is there was one, uh, uh, a mother and an infant that were infected who were living in this space. And uh, about uh, several months after infection, some researchers went in and took both dust samples and swab samples of surfaces. And every time you see a circle here, it's a swab sample. The size of the circle is how much of the viral RNA uh, they found. And every time you see a square, it's a dust sample. And again, the size corresponds to the amount of the virus that they found. So this is several months after infection. And uh, uh, we learned several things from this type of investigation. One is that, uh, and several have talked about this, the viral material gets everywhere in, a, in an indoor space. And uh, the adult who lived in this space was kind of a pretty rigorous cleaner, and uh, she cleaned a lot of surfaces. Uh, and uh, 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 you know, even if cleaning and, and disinfection is useful, there's a lot of surfaces that we end up mi uh, missing uh, uh, in an environment. And one thing that might not be obvious from this is we're not saying anything about infectivity here. I'm sure that none of this viral material was infective anymore, but it was at some point. And so there is this 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 need to understand, you know, what of these uh, 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 reflect risk. The other take home message is you shouldn't lick the floor, the filter uh, or your TV. Uh, another experiment we did recently is we looked at at, at uh, individuals who uh, were isolating from COVID-19. And uh, uh, we put little filters that we use as samplers inside the isolation area, in the hallway right outside, wherever they were isolating, and in the living room on a different floor. And this is work uh, being done by uh, Zoe Hoskin, and, uh, who's a graduate student, and Sarah Haynes, a colleague of mine. And uh, uh, what we found is in all of these environments, oh, and by the way, the top graph is, is the same as the bottom graph. It just excludes the blue, uh, uh, which was a very high concentration household. And what we find here is that you know, isolation really works. The concentration drops dramatically from the isolation zone to the hallway, uh, to the living area. Uh, and, uh, and so isolation really works. Uh, there's a lot of difference between individuals. For the record, I was the blue here. Uh, and so when I got COVID and I was isolating in our basement, uh, I was producing a ton of viral material. And there is that individual difference. And, uh, uh, and uh, again, we really need to understand what kind of infection risk this conveys, not just the spread uh, of the viral RNA. So there's lots of things that don't work too. Some have been talked about already. 
you know, there's no kind of safe distance here because uh, some of the viral material can remain infective over long distances. So this idea of, you know, two meters is safe and, 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 and further than two meters isn't. Another thing that's been talked about a little bit, but I think is worth highlighting specifically is the use of barriers. So plexiglass barriers uh, 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 really only address large particles with substantial velocities. Everything else just goes around them, like the air goes around them. And there are some downsides of plexiglass barriers. They end up uh, impeding ventilation and dilution in some spaces. And so they can actually lead to kind of a higher viral concentration on one side of the barrier. And so if you are using barriers, and they certainly have their applications, um, sneeze guard at a salad bar is a good example, uh, but uh, uh, they certainly have their applications. You know, they really need to be large floor to ceiling barriers, and you really need to think about protecting the person uh, uh, on, on either side, but, but particularly, usually it's an employee side who's exposed to a lot of different people. So you have to think of, still think about masking, uh, air cleaning, and other measures. Um, and, and of course, you have to make sure you're not messing up ventilation. So um, I wanted to finish with some practical strategies here. And one of the things that frequently comes up when people are talking about measures to reduce infectious disease or to improve indoor environments is just how much it costs. And I think that's really a false measure. We should talk instead about uh, how much uh, uh, it costs not to do these things. And so uh, 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 there is a variety of data out there that show if we have healthy in school, uh, healthy school and work environments, we get a variety of benefits. And when people calculate the benefit to cost ratio, uh, which is uh, uh, mostly the avoided healthcare costs, but there are some other things that factor in it too, you typically see numbers, these are numbers for filtration of different efficiencies you typically see numbers across a bunch of different studies that use different methodologies and different types of buildings where the benefits exceed the costs by a factor of 10 to 100. So we're kind of being foolish by not investing in this stuff because of these large benefits. I talked about good information earlier, and one thing I wanted to say explicitly is ASHRAE has, a, this far predates the pandemic, but it has this indoor air quality guide uh, which is available for free as a PDF, or you can buy a hard copy of it uh, from the ASHRAE bookstore. And what this is, is a series of strategies to address uh, uh, indoor air quality, uh, including infectious disease transmission in commercial buildings. And it's a series of about, I forget how many, 50 or 60 strategies, uh, uh, an example of which is on the right. And the book is divided into two parts. One part is kind of a plain language, clear guidance. It's very useful for uh, discussing things with clients or for uh, those who don't necessarily have uh, all of the technical background. And then there's a companion back part of the book for each of the strategies that goes into the evidence and the details and how to actually practically do it. So it's a very useful, useful resource uh, uh, for those in the workshop, for example. So just some parting thoughts here. I talked about the kind of disproportionable uh, effect. And I think that there's been a lot of people in the interior design community who've given a lot of thought to who is using spaces and how spaces might uh, emphasize or de-emphasize uh, existing uh, uh, disparities. And I think uh, uh, we have an enormous opportunity here to, uh, to improve indoor air uh, people are thinking about it or caring about it because of things like COVID-19. And so we can uh, address these things. The other last parting comment I want to make is that, you know, indoor air quality is this little bit of a, of, a, of, a, of a strange thing in that, you know, it doesn't fit neatly into any profession. And of course, that highlights the importance of multidisciplinary work. But I also think it highlights the importance for interior design to, to really, you know, take some ownership of this issue and integrate it into interior design practice. And I'll finish here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Siegel, for sharing these contributions with the audience. I'd like to ask 
uh, Dr. Bergerich Gerber to join us once again so that we can uh, begin a question and answer session. For the audience, please share your questions uh, through the Zoom Q&A function. Maybe I'll start in that I, I thought there was a lot of really interesting direct correlation in both of your kind of uh, views in terms of the research that you, you're both leading. And specifically when it comes to the indoor essential oil of diffusers, it's a funny kind of correlation between both of your research. Uh, Jeffrey, you spoke about the example of the use of indoor essential oil diffusers and essentially how it degrades indoor air quality. And yet we heard from Borchen's study in that essential oil, specifically bergamot for I assume females, helps reduce stress and increases the well-being of users. How do you both uh, suggest that as interior designers or individuals that contribute to built environments, balance the potential quality of indoor air versus the potential of de-stressing individuals which may contribute to their well-being? I don't know if, if one of you wants to maybe start, we'll start there and get some thoughts around that kind of interesting balance of science versus well-being and how both of you are looking at these examples. Yeah, so maybe I'll jump in first and say that I, I think you know, that, by the way, that also shows up with plants. I didn't show the exactly much of the research on plants that shows that people like environments that have plants in them. Uh, uh, and so I, I have two answers to your question. The first one is, I think it's so important that people have information. Uh, and so, you know, it's, 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 you know, people can make good decisions if they have good information. And so, you know, the example of the the started the, the apartment that started my whole interest with essential oil diffusers, you know, we showed that data to the to the occupant who lived there and was using the essential oil diffuser. And it turns out, you know, what they were really interested in is the humidification that they got. So we were able to share with them about things like steam humidifiers, which can uh, raise humidity without addressing, uh, without causing some of the hazards. And so. I think that 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 information is so key. And then the second thing is, you know, I study indoor air, but I more than recognize indoor air is not the beginning and the end uh, of the discussion. And so uh, there are so many practices we might do, smudging, uh, burning of incense, use of candles uh, that uh, people do for very important reasons. And again, it's just a question of, you know, uh, uh, thinking about who's in the space when you're doing it and recognizing the risk. And one of the things I've learned from some uh, indigenous health colleagues, uh, they've talked about how tobacco, which can be very important in some indigenous traditions, you know, it doesn't have to be uh, burned to have the, the, the importance, the cultural importance uh, uh, and the importance to practice. And so there's a lot of times where once people have the information about, about hazards, they can choose to adapt their practices or not. I don't think I can answer better than Dr. Jeffrey Siegel answered. Uh, uh, I think his his response relating to providing information to people to make the best choice. I think that's the that's uh, one of the most important contributions we can make as research uh, uh, community. And this, I mean, your example is perfect, Cohen, but it shows up in different places, even in my small experiment between males and females. <laughs> if they're sharing the space, <laughs> their responses were so different. Um, actually, they females loved it and males disliked it as much as females liked it. So it was incredible. And I posed this question between health and comfort and or comfort and energy and health, right? Uh, you can look at it from a, an, a higher level goal setting perspective to a very operational day-to-day -day, uh, living uh, perspective as well. Um, that's why I said let's quantify, let's 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 understand, right, and provide that information to the users, and uh, try to understand what is the underlying motivation of the users. And sometimes I I think Jeffrey, you gave a great example, right? It was it's not the scent, it's more the humidification. Um, so the more research we have uh, and the more we communicate that research with uh, the occupants of buildings, I think the better it is. And, and also the building operators and 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 owners, building owners. Yeah, and, it, and I definitely saw the correlation between your conversations when it comes to greenery, right? Like plantings and environments that may inhabit 
infection uh, issues in, hot, in healthcare settings versus the biophilic potential of well-being. Maybe it's about what are the benefits of not necessarily introducing real plants, as an example. These are some of the questions that I raised for myself as both of you were speaking. Uh, there was a question from the audience, if I may uh, break to that and ask Dr. Uh, Berdrick Berth, uh, Berzard, but considering that your research, uh, recent research started in 2020, I'd like to know if the participants were required to inform you if they tested positive for COVID-19. It is now known that COVID-19 disease causes many symptoms, some in the acute phase, others in the chronic phase. Some 20, 200 symptoms have been identified, some physical, some mental, Tying information of an infection and or long COVID into your study uh, should offer some interesting insights. Can you elaborate on this topic? Um, I think uh, that the uh, person is referring to the survey that we conducted. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think we had widespread testing available at the time. We started that survey at the end of April and ended it at the beginning or first uh, half of uh, June of 2020. Um, so no, we didn't have that information. I don't think they had that information. None of us had that information because the testing was not available at the time. Um, so I don't have uh, that information. Yeah, I I'm not gonna guess. <laughs> No problem. And there was another question as well that asked, I proposed a CR box building workshop for my kid's school. One of the parents and MDPHD claimed that air filters were overly politicized and that not every room actually needs one. I didn't know how to respond. How would you have responded? Maybe we'll start, uh, Jeffrey, with you. Yeah, so this gets into a really interesting issue. We actually wrote an article that was just rejected. So we're figuring out what to do about it, about uh, this exact issue. Like, why do people think that that portable air cleaners don't work? At this point, there is overwhelming evidence from a variety of different diseases and contexts that, you know, the best you're going to do is not change the risk. Uh, sorry, the worst you're going to do is not change the risk that much. Uh, uh, and the best you're going to do is you're going to improve it a lot. And uh, and so um, the way that um, that that I respond to that particular issue is, you know, I'm able to provide the evidence uh, if people people want. So again, it kind of gets back to the information topic. But the other thing is very often listen to people about what the actual concern is. And so noise, I mentioned, comes up a lot of time as the concern. So people say not every room needs it is another way sometimes of saying that the noise is a problem in some environments. And so, for example, when I'm talking with teachers, I often say, you know, look, you know, it's, first of all, if you can get two smaller air cleaners, that's often very desirable from kind of a room mixing perspective. It's also quieter uh, for the same cleaning power, but also, you know, turn the air cleaners down when noise is an issue uh, and risk is low. Uh, and uh, so, for example, people are masked or the students aren't walking around or they're not, you know, talking loudly, all those kinds of things. And then, you know, turn them up when when you can tolerate the noise. And so a lot of it is listening to what people's actual concerns are. Sometimes there are concerns about costs. There are, there are a lot of, of, of other issues that often have at least a partial solution. And so um, very often it's not actually about the evidence, it's about something else. Thanks, Jeffrey. Um, maybe I'll ask a more, a, what was interesting as well in both of the conversations and research that you both have is how do you think that, and I think both of you effectively spoke of uh, connections to interior design, again, as part of the consideration for architects and designers uh, working and being able to be advocates as part of conversations to shape our built environments. I'm wondering if there's any other correlations or connection uh, between both of you that you saw overlapping in your area of expertise. Um, can you give some further insight to it? I think we spoke a little bit about, uh, we talked about um, at the start around air quality versus well-being or de-stressors, but is there any other conversation or points that you saw correlating that interior designers can take away from today's conversation? And maybe, uh, Borchen, if I can ask for you to start us off. 
Um, so I am not an air quality expert, so I'll leave that part of the question to Jeffrey. But um, I think materials are very important uh, uh, in an in indoor environment uh, from air quality perspective, but also I can tell from sense from sense of belonging to stress to to your mood, right? Uh, and I try to, and others as well, quantify that using virtual environments, how people feel in an environment where there are different, uh, you know, virtual materials uh, uh, presented to them. Um, so I think there's more research needed in that. Uh, and I'm, 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 maybe Jeff can explain the air quality uh, related uh, uh, implications of materials, but I can see that that's an, not an easy hanging fruit, but it's, it's a good example that maybe connects both talks. I would say that, um, I'll, I'll talk about materials in a second, but I would say two really big picture things that, 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 that connected is, one is um, just the diversity of individuals in a building and even how we use the same spaces over time. Uh, and so we need this, I think that interior designers are both have given this a lot more thought, uh, uh, but have really given thought to kind of the flexibility of how spaces are used and, and what that means from the perspective of the individuals in the space and some of the measures we might take. So I think the diversity of individuals and the diversity of spaces are, are a, a connection point there. Uh, on the building materials, I mean, uh, some others in the seminar talked about things like emissions from building materials. Uh, uh, Dr. Farrow talked this morning about the the role of different flooring materials and resuspension uh, of, of of particles. I think there's a lot of direct connections uh, uh, that way as well. But I think that another piece that interior designers really have much better than 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 potentially some other uh, disciplines is that. Uh, we recently renovated the bathrooms in our house and there was just this overwhelming array of like you pick a towel rod there is like this overwhelming array of different uh uh towel rods and and you know just like this this dizzying array of possibilities and so i think there's a lot of skill and and expertise in the interior design uh, community about how do we start thinking about material choices material options and how can we convey the the pieces that are important to, to clients about how those things might affect uh, indoor health? And so I think that's another point of connection that 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 that, that cuts across several of the, of the discussions in the seminar. That individual can... differences is a very very important one actually, and I, that's a question I would love if anybody in the crowd uh, or community can answer because I get that question all the time. Uh, the question asked to me is like, okay, you tell me all of these things, but how do we really operationalize this in a real building? One example was around the discussion related to neurodiverse workers, right? They uh, need uh, very, they might need different conditions in terms of lighting, in terms of noise, in terms of tactile surfaces. And one idea was like, maybe we create pods for them and then put them in this corner of the building. And then the other said like, how is that inclusive? <laughs> <laughs> putting them in a corner <laughs> or, or like not integrating them uh, with the others. Uh, I don't have a good answer to that. Uh, should we think about spaces in a very different way? Maybe, maybe we're stuck in the way that we're thinking and it has to be in this way. Therefore, what we are telling those differences are not met within that constraint. Maybe we need to change the constraints. I'm, I, I don't know, but that's, uh, that's a very good uh, question. How do we satisfy multiple groups uh, without, with inclusivity in mind, right? Absolutely. And cost. I, I'm sorry to go back to the cost, but that's also, that I wasn't like this, but every time I present uh, to a building owner or a facility manager, they're like, but what about the cost? So I started thinking about costs uh, as well. It's definitely the correlation of when when both of you, specifically Borjan, when you're speaking about individual controls and individual environments that um, affect directly affect and um, <clears throat> individuals' well-being. My, my my biggest question that's very running through my mind is 
as someone who works in large, complex civic or educational projects where you have, again, exactly what you're describing, a very diverse um, spectrum of individuals that use space, how do we actually implement individually controlled opportunities to increase well-being or even indoor air quality through individual uses when the entire premise of projects I work on is about being, bringing a lot of people together um, in a singular space. I don't know if, like to your point, if there is an answer or solution for that in terms of um, maybe it's different when you're designing homes, as an example, as Jeffrey, you noted, when you are designing your own individual house or an apartment or your uh, small um, kind of controlled area may be slightly easier versus larger kind of environments where big groups are are kind of congregating and are meant to use. There was another question, if I may, um, from the audience, and I'll just ask uh, just as a follow up. This is specifically Jeff for you. Do you know of any ultraviolet germicidal um, ir radiation in installations in public settings in Canada? Yeah, I mean, uh, it kind of depends on how you define public uh, settings. But yes, I know of, of many, many. In fact, one of the most famous studies been demonstrating the benefits of UV is from an office building in Montreal where they did alternate floors with and without UV. Uh, uh, and there, there are just almost too many to count. And I think that, um, you know, I knew that uh, Dr. Miller was going to talk about it. So, so I didn't talk about UV that much. Uh, but, you know, just like with everything else, the story of UV is much more a story of how it is used than the technology itself. I think sometimes we focus on specific technologies because they're easier to talk about, but the contextual piece is so important. So if someone lets those lamps get dirty, uh, so they're not having the output or doesn't maintain them. Uh, or or a host of other issues that occur with 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 UV, then you don't get the same performance. And so I really think we need to move our thinking less from you know a particular technology or a particular focus to how are we using these things and how are we going through a reasonable design process to put these things in 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 different spaces where they make sense. Perfect. Thank you. There was an actual follow up to our previous discussion around individually controlled spaces and differences. The question was, did the building occupants have suggested solutions on how to handle individual differences? And I know we kind of touched on it, but maybe, uh, Jeff, if you want to have any initial thoughts, and we'll pass it to Fortune as well. Yeah, so one thing is, I think there's a lot of reason to be optimistic on this on this individual case. So you can think about something like cigarette smoking. When when I was a kid, you know, almost every building allowed smoking in some part of it. Uh, you know, I remember walking by the teachers' lounge in my elementary school, and it would be like a cloud of smoke coming out of it. And uh, uh, and so uh, uh, and you know, we've moved beyond that in our spaces, we've addressed this very serious uh, health issue. And, and I think that, um, you know, so I think we have the ability to address even very big uh, indoor air and health problems uh, if we do it well. Uh, and I think that, that part of the, you know, certainly listening to occupants, I think it's also coming back to this information piece. You know, I might love to use an essential oil diffuser at my desk, but if someone shows me, hey, look, you know, here are some of the concerns about using uh, an essential oil diffuser, I might realize that, oh, uh, maybe there's 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 other ways I could achieve it. So, for example, directly applying essential oil uh, is has has uh, a different set of things, but not really the same health concerns as putting it in a diffuser. And so, I think that that there's there's again, it kind of comes back to. People don't know the consequences of their actions. Sometimes they don't care, but let's be positive here and think that people do care and want to do the right thing. And then, you know, certainly include them as part of the conversation. So um, I did, I will give two examples um, from my conversations with occupants. One is with uh, working with neurodiverse, uh, highly functional neurodiverse uh, individuals. Um, these are uh, people who would, who are, um, who are skilled in a trade and they want to have uh, uh, work opportunities alongside with uh, other colleagues. And they are very open to adapting to what is currently available. 
and they were asking us if there are any breakout rooms, right? Uh, when we're overstimulated, uh, that we can go to those rooms <laughs> and then relax. So there are, uh, I mean, it depends on, I think, who you're talking with, but in that group of uh, individuals I was talking with had high motivation to be able to perform their 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 skills uh, their, in, in the trade. Um, in other examples, uh, and, and people also have space attachments, so that's that's another one. Hot desking helps, right? Uh, we have a lot of issues feeling too cold or too hot in uh, certain uh, parts of the building. Of course, if you have an assigned space, it's very difficult, uh, you know, to, to if I'm always cold, for example, <laughs> but putting me with somebody in the same mechanical zone who's always hot is not going to work. But if, if there's flexibility in the design of space, and if you can have people choose, uh, their own space based on their comfort. But that's the other thing. I think this is really important, that flexibility that is, that our comfort also changes, right? It doesn't always stay as is. Of course, some there are some people that are like me always cold, but then in different parts of uh, the season or different parts of a work environment, um, periods, right? I feel differently uh, in terms of my space. So giving me that or the occupant that flexibility to choose, uh, might be the way to go instead of trying to create highly individualized spaces. And sometimes I talk to the occupants, they talk about like a dial system, right? I wish there was a place like where I can dial lighting on and off. And, you know, they really want that, uh, uh, like a DJ uh, <laughs> a table that they can uh, turn things on and off or adjust for themselves. I think that would be one way of addressing that individual differences. Some really great points. And as someone who has a space heater underneath their desk in the office all year round, I sympathize with uh, some of the individually controlled um, suggestions that you have. Same goes for task lighting as an example in terms of being able to control your lighting at, at uh, where you work. I, I think we're right on time. So I just wanted to thank Dr. Berger Gerber and Dr. Siegel for sharing your insight and answering questions. Um, that will help interior designers gain perspectives for creating healthy, healthier interiors. With this, uh, we're closing session five of the symposium. We'll take a five minute break um, and we'll return for section, uh, session six at 2.30. So thank you both for joining and um, Lois, I'll pass it back to you.